And do we know him as Jehovah Jireh? If you get to know God, walk with him, you'll learn to know him as Jehovah Jireh. God always provides. If you honor and trust him, people say, well, God's not providing for me. Are you doing what he's asked you to do? Are you obeying what he's asked or are you withholding? And there's a lot of people in this room that you can do incredible things for the kingdom, but you're hoarding up everything. And you need to do things significant for people in their lives and to help people. We're in a series that we titled The Good Book. Uh, for some folks that are new, uh, we've been in this series for the last few weeks. We're gonna be in it to uh, November. We're gonna go through some of the top 40 highlights, uh, most important, significant things that's happened in the scriptures throughout this year. And we're asking you to read through the Bible with us. And so hopefully you're reading through the Bible. If you need a Bible plan, you can go out to get services, ask somebody out there. I think they can get you uh, some help, get you situated. But anyway, we're, we're, we're highlighting things. Last, year, or last week we talked about Abram, um, who left his family and his friends um, in Haran to uh, go uh, to do what God wanted him to do. And sometimes you got to leave your past behind. Now, today we're talking about Abraham. So Abram, in, in the middle of when we talked last week and this week, God changed his name to Abraham, which means father of many nations. And so we're going to pick it up in Genesis 22 here in a moment. But Genesis 22 opens with a phrase that leaves a strong impression, or should. The Bible starts out with, sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Now, I don't know about you, but I wasn't a big fan of tests when I was in school, and especially pop quizzes. Like, you walked in, today we're going to take a pop quiz, and I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm going to flunk again, you know, because I wasn't ready for the test, let alone a pop quiz. But I wasn't fond of tests, and, and so, and if, but if God tested Abraham, does that mean that God will also test us? And I know people get caught up with God never tests anybody. The Bible says God will never tempt anybody. And we're going to talk through what temptation is versus being tested, your faith being tested. That the only way to grow is to, and to develop is to work out your spiritual muscles, if you would. And we found out through COVID that a lot of Christians had no spiritual muscle, muscles. They never really had to use their faith. So when the world said, be afraid, be afraid, the church was afraid. When the world said, isolate, isolate, we isolated, even though the Word of God never told us to do that. God never told us to be afraid one day, and He never told us to isolate. So isn't it interesting that now we're, we're, we're working with people, and we're wanting to, for people to grow in their faith, so if something crazy ever happens again, we'll know how to stand. We'll know how to do it. And so let's pick it up in Genesis chapter 22. I'm going to read verses 1 through 19. The Bible says, Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, he replied, here I am. Take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. The next morning, Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him, along with his son, Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told the servants. The boy and I will travel a little farther. We will worship there, and then we will come right back. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. We have the fire and the wood, the boy said, but where is the sheep for the burnt offering? God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son, Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. When they arrived at the place where God had told him to go, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. Then he tied his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham picked up the knife to kill his son as a sacrifice. At that moment, the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Yes, Abraham replied, here I am. Don't lay a hand on the boy, the angel said. Do not hurt him in any way, for now I know that you truly fear God, you have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. 
Then Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught by its horns in a thicket. So he took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering in place of his son. Abraham named the place Yahweh, Yira, which means the Lord will provide. We know it as Jehovah Jireh. To this day, people still use that name as a proverb. On the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called again to Abraham from heaven. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and have not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. And through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. Then they returned to the servants and traveled back to Beersheba, where Abraham continued to live. So this passage recounts one of the most dramatic and poignant episodes in the Bible, where Abraham the patriarch, so the patriarchs of our faith would be Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Abraham, the patriarch of our faith, faces an unimaginable test. It's a story that should challenge us, maybe even comfort us and compel us maybe to re-examine our relationship with God. And so what we need to understand is God is not in the behavioral modification business. And that's where most churches come to. Most Christians, whether they say it that way or not, they are. They believe that God just wants to modify your behavior. And so that's called religion. And humanity didn't need another religion. So God sent Jesus so we could have a relationship. Religious people are those folks that always think they're right, always pointing out everybody's faults, always saying dumb stuff about God and, and their faith. And, and it's just amazing to me how people get so religious and, and they're so sanctified, like, we shouldn't talk like that. We're Christians. We shouldn't act like that. And there are some things we should not do and some things we should do. But God and our relationship is more than just a religion. And I used to be very religious, very dogmatic about things. My oldest daughter, I said, you can't listen to anything but Christian music. And, and, and then I got in her car one day and she had some country music and some other stuff and I'm, and, and I'm and nothing bad, but I was mad. I'm like, I told you. And today I'm like, I don't care what you listen to. That's up to you and God. And, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because I was so religious. I, I, was, I bought into behavior modification and yes, we need to change our behavior, but not that way. We need to change it because we love God, God lives in us, we have a relationship, and we just wanna do better, live better, and be better. That's what faith is. That's what God came to do. He sent Jesus to die for us. And I'm not condoning sin, I'm not saying go do what you want. We should change our behaviors. But serving God is more than just behavioral modification, which when we get caught up in, you get religious. And, and we, we need to be compassionate. Having a relationship with God makes you more compassionate, makes you more merciful and gracious with people. In other words, you're willing to help them instead of point out their faults, because we all have faults. And the ones who point the faults out the most are the ones who probably have the most faults. And, and we, we've, got to, we've got to realize that God is just not here pointing fingers at everybody. He wants a real relationship with you. One where he knows you're gonna make mistakes. One where he knows you're gonna falter. But then you come back to Christ and you come back to God and he forgives us every time. There was a man, we talk about God testing. He was the only survivor of a shipwreck. He washed up on a small and uninhabited island. And daily he would cry out to God, rescue me Lord, rescue me, I need rescued. But in the meantime, the man built a small hut to protect himself, a lean-to, from the elements. And one day while he was out searching for food, his lean-to caught on fire and was instantly engulfed in flames. The man was struck with grief, feeling anger toward God and pity for himself. But early the next morning, a ship drew near the island and rescued the man. When asked, how he had been found, the captain was surprised. What do you mean, how were you found? We saw your smoke signal yesterday. He offered and knew where to find you. 
See, God's testing is often his way of helping us even if we don't fully appreciate it at the time or understand it at the time. And so God was helping this man, and yet he was mad at God. And how many of us get mad at God, and even though he's really trying to help us, we're angry with him? Because we have this thought that if we serve God, everything will work out just like we want it to. No, when we serve God, everything works out like he wants it to. And it may be different than what you think. And when you get caught up in your religious because humanity didn't need another religion. That's not why God came. He came to change your life. He came to live in us, and we would have a deep respect and honor of him and reverence that we would purpose just to do better in our lives. You have a preacher, I still make mistakes. Every one of us makes mistakes. Every one of us. And if you're that person that says, well, I don't make many mistakes or I don't make mistakes, then you've called God a liar because the Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And if you say you have not sinned, then you're calling God a liar. So as righteous as some folks think they are, they're just the same as the worst person they can look at. Now that that won't float anybody's boat, will it? But there's a difference between being tested and tempted to do evil. James 1.13 says, and remember, in 14, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. Temptations come from ungodly sources and are designed to cause believers to fall away from their relationship with God, to just keep falling away. Testing, on the other hand, comes from God and is designed to help you, to grow you, to show you your dependence on God, as well as bring you closer to Him. And so when you go through some things in life, you see older folks, and they don't seem to get as excited as younger folks at certain things. It's because they have experience. If you see a young family, their first child, they treat that first child like everything's bad. Like if their pacifier falls on the ground, they're like, we gotta sterilize it. <laughs> they can't lay on the floor, or whatever. By the second kid, it's like, just pick it up, my other dog, put it back in. <laughs> oh, so he ate a little dirt, it won't kill him. <clears throat> because we get some experience, and then by the fifth kid, they just doing whatever they wanna do. It's like, go ahead and eat that cockroach. We don't care. (laughs) You'll survive. But what I'm saying is, as we grow with God, the experience helps us manage our emotions better, manage situations better, so we're not just all over the place. But if you're not willing to go through the tests and trials, and didn't Jesus say, you will have tribulation, you will have issues. In this world, he promised, he said it was going to happen. And if he said it's going to happen, for you to say it's not going to happen calls God a liar again. God tests us. I don't like to test. And, and, And yet, from some of the things I've encountered in life, I seem to handle certain things better than I used to. And hopefully that's what we all do when we grow with God. But God tested Abraham. In Genesis 22, 1, where it says the word tested, it's the Hebrew word nasa, and I love what it means. It means proving the quality of something, usually by putting it through a trial of some kind. So when we're tested, God is proving the quality of us, and by putting us through a trial of some kind, we grow and we develop, and he proves us. What does he prove? That we still worship God, we still honor God, we still reverence God, regardless of what we're experiencing in life. Because we've all go through them. Whether you believe it or not, you're going, you're gonna go through some of those things. So God wanted to prove the validity and authenticity of Abraham's faith. See, and what we need to understand, excuse me, is God knows everything. He knows exactly how you're gonna come out in that test, but we don't. So when you walk into a test or a trial or situation and you don't handle it well, you don't do well, then you know what you're supposed to do? You're supposed to learn from it and say, you know what, next time I'll handle that better. Next time I'll deal with it, you know, a little bit better. And, and so that's what it's meant to do. And, and we, we need to understand God is trying to 
exercise your spiritual muscles, which is your faith and belief in him. And, and when you exercise that, you grow in it. And people get mad at God, like, I don't know why I'm having to go through this. Well, learn to go through with a better attitude, like the shipwreck guy. He was mad that his lean to burned. He was grieving. He was sad. And yet God was trying to save his life. And how, how do we not know that God is trying to save our lives? Trying to help our lives. Not trying to hurt you. God never hurts you. The devil hurts you. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus came or God came so you could have life and more abundantly. It doesn't mean you're not going to have obstacles, though. You're going to have to overcome. We're going to have to get in control of our emotions. We're going to have to get in control of our mouth and what comes out of it. And so God tested Abraham. And this test seems to me beyond comprehension. But what stands out in this story is not the nature of the test, but Abraham's response to it. Without recorded objection, Abraham rose early the next morning to obey God's command. In his actions, Abraham teaches all of us a profound lesson about faith. Are you ready? <coughs> Here it is. He valued obedience to God more than understanding his ways. And so often today in our culture, we think we have to understand everything. And even when you think you understand something with God, you realize you don't. Later on, you'll be like, oh, man, I'm learning more and more. But Abraham taught us a lesson. You obey even when you don't understand. He could have said, God, I don't get it. You, you, you promised me all this stuff. You, made, you changed my name from Abram to Abraham, which means father of many nations. You finally gave me a son with Sarah. He's the heir to, to the next generation of you developing your people. And now you want me to sacrifice them? I need some understanding here. But instead of asking for that, he rose up early the next day. Now, you got to understand, Isaac wasn't some little kid. You watch stories, they show him as a little four or five-year-old. How does a little four or five-year-old carry all the wood for an offering? Most people believe he was probably a teenager. Abraham didn't have him until he's almost 100, or right at 100. And so, say he's 15, Abraham's 115 years old. I want you to think about this. But he put Isaac on the altar, strapped him down, and was doing this, and Isaac submitted to his father. Now, Isaac could have ran from him. He could have went, can't get me. <laughs> what was Abraham going to do? If he went one way, he probably stayed that way. <laughs> Isaac could have ran up just a little bit, and Abraham said, come here, son. Let me go. <laughs> and it should teach us all, especially young people in the room and watching, you got to honor your folks. Now, listen. It doesn't mean you have to love them or even like them because it doesn't say love them. Most people read the fifth commandment, honor your mother and father. Uh, they, they read it as love your mother and father. God knew there'd be some bad parents. He knew there'd be some awful parents, mean parents, lost parents, broken parents. Well, how do I honor them then, preacher? You honor them by praying for their soul and their salvation. That's how you honor them. And you don't... You don't try to go out and badmouth them to everybody. But see, we have no honor and respect in our culture at all today. None. You see it everywhere you go. And you and I have got to come to a place where we understand, honor my mother and father. I pray that prayer over my life daily. Father, I thank you. I honor my mother and father, which I believe is an earthly blessing. And I thank you that you said it'd be well with me and I live long on the earth. So I thank you for that I would have great quality of life as well as longevity of life. Why? Because I'm invoking your promise in the fifth commandment, which is the only commandment with a promise attached to it, that it'll be well with you and you'll live long on the earth. And so we, we, I pray that to this day. You mean you still honor your mother and father? My, my dad's in heaven and I still honor him. How do I honor him? By his memory. I, I, I thank God for him, that he was in my life. Was he the perfect parent? No, but he was a good parent. He taught us to drink and smoke and cuss and all that stuff. <laughs> and at the time, you know, that was what we did. And all four boys wanted to be like our dad. So that's what we did. And then God changed our life. And then God changed his life. 
And we, we do that by honoring, and I, I don't have enough time to get into that, but just a thought. But he valued, Abraham valued obedience to God more than understanding his ways. In our lives, how often do we find ourselves demanding understanding before we offer our obedience to God? We want everything to make sense, to fit neatly into our plans and expectations. Yet Abraham's faith was different. He obeyed even when it made no sense, even when it would cost him dearly and deeply. He obeyed God. And a lot of times we're not going to understand. There's some things I don't understand at all. I don't understand how God forgives me every time I mess up. I don't understand how powerful, fully understand how powerful forgiveness is. The reason God says when you stand praying forgive so your Father in heaven can forgive you is because if you hold on forgiveness, it destroys your life. Years and years ago I read, and I don't remember who it was now, but years and years ago I read a story of a psychiatrist or psychologist running an insane asylum or a place where people had mental illnesses. Back then you said a lot of other things. And so he ran and he said, if I could just get people to do this, to forgive themselves, 85% of the people would walk out today. So it seems like, well, I can forgive somebody. I believe God can forgive me, but sometimes we can't forgive ourselves. And let me help somebody here. The reason you have to forgive yourself is because when you become born again, when you ask Jesus to be Lord of your life, you are no longer your own. The Bible says you're his. You're not your servant, you're his servant. And how dare you hold something against his servant? I don't understand how all this works. I don't understand the full power of forgiveness. I just know I've just purposed in my life personally not to let anybody hold me hostage. And you say, what do you mean hold you hostage? When you are in unforgiveness towards someone, they're holding your life right here. And I said, nope, not gonna let it happen. I let things go and I purpose to try to forget them and forget about them and act like it never happened. Now it doesn't mean I totally forget what happened but I purpose to forgive. And I'm gonna tell you, the hardest person for me to forgive is me. And I'm thinking, God, you forgive me every time? I don't understand that. But I act on it anyway. I, see, that's, that's getting to know God. There's some things that you don't understand. I don't understand when people come up to me, used to come up to me all the time and say, you know, I have $200 in my bank account, 150 goes for bills, I got 50 left over for the whole week, and you mean God wants me to give him 20 bucks? And now I answer, absolutely, he wants you to give you 20 bucks. Well, I don't understand. I don't either how it works. I just know it works. So you have to obey God without understanding. You know, preacher, I work six days a week. I hate coming to church on Sunday. I gotta go play golf. Or if you're a woman, I gotta go get my nails done or my face done or my feet done, toes done. I, I gotta go to the knitting class, whatever. And, and, in our, and in this room, it's probably, some women are like, I gotta go to the range and learn and, and get better shooting my gun. Because we, you know, there was a young lady in our church this morning wearing the shirt, Save Not Soft. It's my favorite shirt. And, 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 and so, you know, and, and so some of our women, they're tough. Now, they're soft when they need, come on, you know, come on. Man, you don't want to lay next to a woman that's firmer than you. And some of you guys, it wouldn't be that hard to do. Come on. I'm playing, kind of. But they're, they're not soft emotionally. They're not soft that way. They're, 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 they, they're not soft spiritually. And, and, and I love the shirt, I just love it, because Christians, most people think we're soft, not in this house. You, I can tell you some churches that are soft, but not legacy. Nuh -uh. And so I don't understand how, you know, people want to do that, and how if, God, if you give God, you know, an hour and a half of your life, that it'll bless your world. There's a lot of things I don't understand, but we do them out of obedience. Come on. And as you walk in obedience, understanding will come. But if you never walk in obedience, you'll always be crying for understanding. And why would God give you understanding when you don't trust him at all anyway? So we gotta learn to trust him. So the question for us today is, are we willing to obey God even when we don't understand? 
Are we willing to trust him fully to surrender our plans, our logic, and even our very blessings if he asks? As Abraham and Isaac journeyed to the place of sacrifice, Isaac asked, Father, where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Abraham replied, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Then, then God provided at the last minute a ram. God revealed himself as Jehovah Jireh to Abraham that day, the Lord will provide. And do we know him as Jehovah Jireh? If you get to know God, walk with him, you'll learn to know him as Jehovah Jireh. God always provides. If you honor and trust him. People say, well, God's not providing for me. Are you doing what he's asked you to do? Are you obeying what he's asked? Or are you withholding? And there's a lot of people in this room that you can do incredible things for the kingdom, but you're hoarding up everything. And you need to do things significant for people in their lives and to help people. Years ago, when we were building the school over here at Los Volcanos, they call it our North Campus because it's just a minute and a half. Well, if you drive the speed limit, it's probably two minutes. If you drive like I do, it's like a minute and a half to get there from here. And so, you know, we were building the gymnasium. We had an upper floor that we needed to finish. So my wife and I took this couple out to dinner one night. And so my wife and his wife were talking, and I'm talking to him, and I said, hey, do you know what? You and I, we have an opportunity right in front of us to affect children's lives long after we're done. Even when we're gone to heaven, we have an opportunity. And he looked at me and goes, Pastor Steve, quit blowing smoke up my skirt. What do you want? <laughs> if he's watching, that, he'll tell you. That's what he said. I said, I need you to give me $500,000. He said, I'm not doing that. No, that's exactly how the conversation went. So then we ate. He said no, but his wife loves education. So I think he went home and talked to his wife. He called me and said, hey, I'm not gonna give you 500,000. I said, okay, you already told me that. He said, I'll give you 400,000. What did I say? Yes, amen, hallelujah. <laughs> and so we built, the, we, built that, we built that upstairs and we named the building after him. And I'm just telling you, he didn't ask us to. There was not even in the thing. But, but he, he's doing something. Their kids will probably never come here as grandkids, but we are affecting kids' lives. That's significance. And you see people saying, I hope you don't take me to lunch. <laughs> like, well, maybe if you get a call, like, hey, Pastor Steve would like to take you to lunch. Just get your checkbook ready. No, I'm kidding you. <laughs> I'm playing. I am playing. So the question is, do we worship the giver or have we become too focused on the gifts? A medieval Christian thinker once noted that humans are tempted to love God in the same way they love a cow for the milk and cheese it provides for what we can get out of the relationship. The ribeyes, the fillets, the New York strips, Man, I'm getting hungry thinking about it. <laughs> medium rare. If you go to a restaurant and you like your rare, medium rare, ask them to Pittsburgh it. If you don't know what Pittsburgh is, they cook the outside real nice and the fat real crispy, but the inside's still medium rare, rare. I'm just helping somebody out here. <laughs> someone, will say, someone will go there and say, hey, can you cook my steak St. Louis style? I'll be like, what? Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. I don't know, I don't know where they got the name, but that's what it's called. But that's how a lot of us worship God, just for everything we can get. But what happens when the blessings seem to dry up? When the gifts maybe are taken away, would we still honor and obey God? See, our love and respect for God must go deeper than the blessings he provides. But we appreciate the blessings, but it's gotta be more than that. It must be rooted in who he is, not just what he can do for us. That's why you hear people all the time when they go through some bad things in life, they blame God, they're mad at God, they're angry at God, they walk away from God. If God really loved me, why is he having this? Why am I having to go through this? Because in order to grow, you're gonna have to walk through some things. If you wanna get bigger and stronger, ask anybody who works out, they have to build themselves up to that weight. If they wanna bench 300, which most people can't, if you wanna get to 300, you, you're not gonna start 300, 300 pounds. You're not gonna walk into a gym and be a bean pole and say, I think, just put 300 on there, I'll get it. That 300 is gonna crush your chest unless you have a spotter. You're gonna start off with 90 pounds. 
And then maybe graduate to 100, and then get to 150, then maybe go to 200. And you're gonna have to do that several reps, then you get to 225 and 250, and then, and then after you can do several reps, then maybe you attempt 300, but it doesn't happen overnight. And what God is trying to help us all today is that your life, if you put it in his hands, if you go through the tests that, that are in front of you without, without too much moaning and complaining and never quitting, you keep going through them, then you'll develop spiritual muscles and you'll be able to handle a whole lot more than you would before. And that's what God's teaching us. And so as we walk with God, it's crucial to distinguish between the tests and the temptations, though. God tests us to strengthen our faith, to draw us closer to him, to refine our character. In contrast, the devil tempts us to pull us away from God, to lead us into sin and despair. He tries to get you away from God. Abraham's test was about faith and obedience, about trusting God's character and his promises, even when the path seemed utterly incomprehensible, he still trusted God. People have speculated, maybe believed, if he has me sacrifice him, he'll raise him from the dead. God can do anything. He's Jehovah Jireh. Or maybe he'll give us another son. At 115 now, Sarah would be, you know, 105 or whatever. That's pretty old to be having kids. But no matter what he believed, he obeyed God, rose up the next morning to obey God. Didn't wait three days. Think about the three-day journey because Abraham and Isaac are really a type and shadow of Jesus and God the Father. God sent his son, but this time he let his son get sacrificed for your sin and my sin. The three days, where was Jesus for three days? In the tomb, and then he was raised to life. So all this is significant. All of it's important. And we don't have time to go through every little nuance in here that, is, that you could learn from, every st you know, story that, that can come out. But we need to understand that we need to obey even when we don't understand. In Billy Frey's book, The Dance of Hope, he tells of a friend named John who was a classmate at the University of Colorado in the 1950s. An accident as a teenager left him both blind and bitter. He had given up hope. Finally, John's father, fed up with his son's perpetual pity party, reminded him of the impending winter to come. He ordered his son to put storm windows on the house. He told John to finish the job before he got home or else. The father left the room, slamming the door behind him, and said, John, you better get this done. Now, John's rage boiled, muttering curses. He felt his way through the house till he found the garage. He was blind, and his dad said, <coughs> excuse me, you better do this before I get home and slam the door on the way out. So he felt his way to the garage. Tools in his hand, he mounted the stepladder. And as he ascended, he found himself thinking, my dad will be sorry when I fall off the ladder and break my neck. But John didn't fall. Inch by inch, he managed to put the storm windows in place. His father's plan worked. If he could install the storm windows, perhaps he could piece his life back together. John discovered years later, everybody say years. Not moments, years later, John discovered that at no time during the day was his father more than a few feet from his side. John's father wasn't about to let his son fall. In the same way, our God, our Father, won't ever let us fall. He is Jehovah Jireh. He is the God that provides. And you may think God is distant. You may say, I don't feel God, he's distant. But I'm gonna tell you something. My Bible says when you're born again, God will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll never reject you or abandon you. And even when you're walking through life and you feel alone, he's probably, he's right there with you. Not probably, he's right there with you. Not gonna let you fall. You may stumble, you may bruise your knee, but he's gonna help you get back up and you're gonna keep walking with God. Why? Because our Heavenly Father loves us much more than we could ever love our own kids. And sometimes God has to put you through something to get you walking again so he can help you piece your life together so you can have a fruitful life. But so many of us are willing to stay stuck in our old ways. I'm not doing that. I don't understand that. 
We believe the lies of the devil. And that's why our lives never change. This story mirrors our journey with God. Even when he, he asks us to do something that seems beyond our ability, he is right there with us, guiding us, ensuring we don't fall. When Abraham climbed that mountain with Isaac, God was with him every step of the way. And when the moment of ultimate sacrifice arrived, God provided. When God stopped Abraham from sacrificing Isaac, he declared, now I know that you truly fear God. You have not withheld from me even your son, your only son. Not in the sense of being afraid did he reverence, but reverence, respect, and trust. A reverential fear of God is not like, oh, I'm afraid this way. It's, a, it's such an awe. It's, it's respect and, and, and honor, and we trust him. See, God's tests are opportunities for us to demonstrate our trust in him, to show that we reverence him above all else. And God, again, will never leave us or abandon us. He is Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. The devil tempts us to sin. God tests us at times to help us grow and develop, to get closer to him. Like Abraham, may we come to know God as Jehovah Jireh. You know, years ago, my wife and I moved from Tulsa, Oklahoma, where she grew up. It's the only place she really knew. And I moved her to Roswell, America. And we, we thought pastoring was going to be, you know, everything. It was going to be easy. It was going to be fun. And it was anything but that. So we get to the church, and the church is negative 500 in the checkbook. They have no money. I have a wife and three kids. I left my job, no insurance, no nothing. And they said they had a house for us, which fell through. They didn't have a house. So we literally moved in what would be probably a, a, the ghetto part of Roswell, or part of it, you know, bad part of town. In fact, our neighbors were, a lot of them were drug dealers. True story. And when we moved in the neighborhood, they're like, where well, are you moving in our neighborhood? You're going to ruin it. I mean, they, we knew who they were, and they knew, you know, they knew that we were going to take over this church. And they really looked at us funny, like, why are you guys living here? Because it's the only place we had to live. That was the worst house I've ever lived in in my life. I drove the worst car in my life when I became a pastor. I mean, it's a clunker. People used to laugh at me and say, they'd never, they never say you are a prosperity preacher. <laughs> okay. And I wanted to quit many times. But my wife, who's a little tougher than I am with these things, she would never quit. There was a time when she was hurt deeply from people in the church. And it was a guy that was on our staff that he wanted to take over. And we went away for a couple, just a couple of days to see her dad and came back and everything was breaking loose. And anyway, he attacked her. And, and it wasn't true. But so I'll never forget my wife is in a chair crying, weeping. My wife's not a crier, but she was weeping. Not just crying like that <clears throat> kind of cry. I'll never forget I walked in the house and I said, we're leaving. I'm done. This is over. I said, I'm going to call Pastor Willie George and hopefully he'll give me a job for a while till we can get settled and get on our feet again. And I'll never forget in her tears, she looked at me and she said, we're not leaving. I said, oh no, I'm done. And she goes, but God told us to come here. I had no understanding of anything. I'm just like, my wife's hurting. This is rugged. This is not what I thought it was going to be. But we stayed. And can I say this to you? Some of us don't stay with God and keep walking with God or obeying God, so we'll never know what life he has for us. You'll never experience it. You'll miss out, and you'll always be mad at God or mad at life when God's all the time saying, if you just obeyed me, you... And you, you you have no idea what I have in store for you. Ear is not heard, eyes not see, what the Lord has in store for those who believe him. And so because we stayed, we worked through it. When we left there, it was the best it's ever been. It was the easiest it had been in, in, in the whole seven years, in four months and so many days. And then that the Lord moved us here. What I'm trying to say is, I didn't understand any of it. God, why we gotta go through this? I didn't know what I know today. 
I'm like, I don't understand. We're not hurting people, but these people are trying to hurt us. I never got an answer. I can understand it some now that God was trying to toughen us up, getting us ready for what's to come because he knows what's to come in your life. And folks, he's not telling you you gotta pass the test with a A plus or 4.0. Just pass the test. Just pass it. And then as you journey through life, you'll realize Man, because I went through this and managed that, I can handle this and it's a lot worse than that. Or you walk through things and you see people walk through them saying, aren't you worried, aren't you fretting, aren't you mad? No, I'm just gonna trust God. And then people like us sometimes get mad at those folks like, what do they mean trust God? This is terrible. And they just keep walking with God. Why? Because when you learn to obey him, even though you don't understand, He'll bless you for it because that's what's called trust. That's what's called trust. And then we'll experience Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for being here. I thank you for teaching us all. I thank you for helping us as we live this life. God, you know it's not easy sometimes, but it's always worth it if we do it with you. Help us to learn to obey even though we don't understand. Help us to learn to obey and honor you even when we don't quite understand. We know at times understanding will come. But man, God, you've just called us to obey. Be obedient. The willing and obedient eat of the fat of the land, the Bible says in Isaiah. So we thank you for your many blessings and your promises. But God, today we purpose to worship the giver, to worship you, not the blessings. And if you took them all away, would we still be honoring you? And I hope the answer is yes, God. That we'd still be believing you, trusting you, even though it looks really bad. I thank you for your many blessings in our lives, your help that you always are trying to help us. In Jesus' name. With every head bowed, if you're here and you say, Pastor, would you pray with me? I walked with God, but I walked away. I want to come home today. I want to trust God. I want to obey him by repenting and asking him to forgive me. Or if you're here and you say, preacher, would you pray with me? I've never really given Jesus my life. I've never made Jesus Lord of my life. Maybe you've prayed a prayer, maybe you haven't, but just praying a prayer doesn't work. You have to make Jesus Lord of your life and then begin to follow him. And salvation is a byproduct of lordship. You, you confess him as Lord and then he saves you from eternal death and hell. So if that's you and you say, preacher, would you pray with me? I'm one of those two spiritual conditions. I just want to get it right. I'm going to obey God even though I don't quite understand it. I know he's real. If that's you, right where you're seated, and you say, preacher, include me in your prayer, I'm going to ask you to do one simple thing. Real quick, no hesitation, just honor God. Would you, right where you're seated, just lift your hand all over this place and say, include me. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you over here. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you over here. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As I look across the top, who else? God bless you, thank you. Anybody else at the top? Thank you, I see your hand, ma'am. Anybody else, as we look across the top, say, preacher, include me in your prayer. Just lift your hand, you say, why do you want me to lift my hand? I want you to be able to acknowledge God, thank you. And say, I don't care what anybody thinks, God, I want you in my life, I'm just gonna learn to trust you and start right now. Anybody else on the top sections? Thank you, God bless you. God bless you, God bless you. Thank you, God bless you. Anybody else in the bottom section? Say, preacher, include me in your prayer. Thank you, I see your hand way back there, ma'am. I see your hand, ma'am. Thank you, thank you, I see it. Thank you. God loves people, guys, that's what I know. I don't understand it all. I don't claim to understand it all. But what I do know is that if we just purpose to obey his word, his word is alive and powerful and change your life. Anybody else before we close? Father, in the powerful name of Jesus, I thank you for every hand raised today. I thank you for every life changed. I thank you for... Uh, people that are here that are learning and growing and, 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 and then they're taking notes and they're like, man, God, I'm going to adjust this and I'm going to adjust that. And God, you're pleased. But for those who are coming to you in repentance and asking you to be Lord of their life, may you touch their life in a great way. May you be gracious and kind to them in Jesus' name. 
If you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer aloud with me. I want everybody in here that's right with God, would you, in support of those, would you pray with us so no one's praying alone? And maybe you didn't lift your hand, but you should have. Would you pray this prayer with us? I'm gonna introduce you to Jesus. Would you pray, God, I choose to believe in Jesus. And I believe he's your son. And I believe he's Lord of all. And I also believe you raised him from the dead to give me a new life. So today, according to your word, with all my heart, I choose to believe. And now with my mouth, I willingly confess, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Now I thank you for saving me, for forgiving me. I choose you. Thank you for choosing me. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord, church.